Glad to be at worship today. Amen. Amen. Let's praise the Lord.
Hello? Hello? Okay. It's amazing what happens when you push the button. Uh, now that was me, not him. And so, uh, but anyhow, Stan, Stan Hutchinson has just gotten back uh, from Nigeria. And uh, one of the projects for VBS, uh, the kids took up money to, uh, to help build bunk beds at the orphanage. And so uh, he's going to come uh, and kind of give us a, a snippet of what happened. Marcy's got some things they want to say. So listen up to what's happening in Nigeria. Good morning, church. Hard to come on. Uh, in the New Living Translation, James writes in chapter 1, verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Hardy and I just uh, left on July the 1st, went to Nigeria, came back on the 15th last Monday night. We were able to build five bunk beds. And uh, yeah. So. We, we have about 24 kids sleeping in beds now rather than on the floor. And I want to thank you. Many of you have supported the Orphanage, Shepherd Care International Ministries, and uh, I just want to remind you that many of your commitments were for 12 months and have run out, so if you would like to recommit, please see me. I will be out front right after service today, and uh, I'd like to talk to you. If you want further information about the Orphanage, we would like to talk to you about that. Uh, I want you to notice here, uh, PJ had the uh, theme of the uh, orphanage as the Vacation Bible School theme this year, and they sent a banner over, we carried a banner over to the orphans at Shepherd Care, and in response, Shepherd Care sent a banner back to our Vacation Bible School kids that you see right here today. And uh, along with that, we want to invite Marcy to come up. She has a letter to PJ and the Vacation Bible School. This is from Chaplain Richard Abor Rockpour, along with the orphans at Shepherd Care. So she's going to read the letter to you. Now, where is PJ? PJ, you have to come up here. This letter is addressed to P.J. Flores, Children's Minister, Mabel White Baptist Church, a letter of appreciation. Let me give you a background. In Bible school, in the missions um, rotations, the children either did cards or letters, which Stan and Hardy carried to those children. So you need that background with this letter. With a very sincere heart of gratitude, we the children of Shepherd Care International Ministries, SCIM, express our profound gratitude to you for the love expressed to us through those beautiful, inspiring, and godly messages in the cards you sent to us. It gives us great joy and encouragement to know that children several miles, several thousand miles, away have us in their hearts. Your prayers and concern will go a long way in helping us to live a better life. We are so grateful for your contribution in making sure we have double bunk beds. We have started sleeping, we have started enjoying a deep and sound sleep on them. On top of the beds, we are closer to God. <laughs> Please continue to remember us. We shall also remember to pray for you. If we do not meet on this side of the world, it is our belief that we shall all meet at the feet of Jesus where we shall all gather to sing praises to him. Amen. Once again, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Richard Abora Rockpour. Okay, we want to present the banner to PJ, which we'll give to the kids, and also in addition to that, we have a couple of banners. One that uh, comes from Shepherd Care to PJ. Whoops, we got them tied together. And Pastor Lee, we have a banner for you that Chaplain Richard sent to you as helping with Mabel White to allow us to support Shepherd Care International Ministries. Thank you so much, and I will be out front immediately following service today, and so if you would stop by and see us there. Thanks so much. Wow, what a great way to start. Can you, are, are you getting it that 
on the other side of the world, they're singing and they're, they're worshiping today just like we are. And although we might not ever meet on this earth, we share in common our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we can be assured that one day we will gather at His feet for all of eternity to lift up and worship Him. Isn't that cool? Amen. That's so good. I want to invite you to stand. Let's all stand together. If you're visiting with us, we, we are just really glad you picked a great day to be here. We want to uh, ask you to fill out one of those cards and drop it in the plate later. We'd love to get some information so we can follow up with you and let you uh, know how glad we are that you're here. But right now, we're just going to turn around. Hey, don't you think it's important in any church that everybody feel welcome? Don't you? Well, let's be sure and make that happen today, okay? So turn around, make sure everybody around you feels welcome, and let's continue to worship.
worship. Lord, we bring you our song today.
great to worship today. Let's praise the Lord. Thank you. Let's be seated. Well, if you brought your Bibles, uh, find Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and I want us to focus on one verse this morning. Verse number 34. Matthew 6, 34. Y'all ready? All right. Matthew 6, 34. Stand with me as uh, we give honor to God's Word. Jesus is speaking. He says, Do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for the time that we have together. We thank you for your word. Lord, we pray for our minds to be open, our hearts to be receptive, and that you would speak into our lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, we live in a, an interesting world, and um, you look at the culture, and everything is going retro. Hairstyles, platform shoes, clothing. I mean, even the automobile has gotten in on it. I mean, the Mustang GT. Uh, the new Thunderbird look, Chrysler's PT Cruiser. Uh, Volkswagen is still making Volkswagen Beetles. And uh, they're even making furniture that's kind of retro. Uh, you can buy appliances now that are green and blue. And I saw some ungodly green looking thing the other day. Reminds me of something that my grandmother used to have in her kitchen uh, a long time ago. 
And so we look at the world, it, it, it's going retro. I was in a department store not long ago and I walked around through the men's section and as I looked over the, what they had on the racks, I just kind of shook my set, head as I walked through because the clothes that I was seeing on the rack reminded me of the styles that were in when I was in high school. And uh, so the truth is, we're good at borrowing stuff from the past and regurgitating it in the present. And, and the thing about your clothes is this, you feel like your clothes, you know, are out of style, don't throw them away, put them in a closet, put them in a box somewhere, just hang on to them because in a few years the cycle will come back around, you can get them out and you'll be right back in the swing of things again. And so we recycle, we replay things from the past as well. And you know, isn't it amazing? It's not always the positive things that we replay. Uh, they have the ability to keep us down. Uh, they have the ability to cripple us in the future. And the past is a tricky aspect of our lives that requires some uh, careful handling because we can, it can either make us feel better, in other words, it feeds our hopes and dreams for the future, or if we're not real careful, the past starves us of our hopes and our dreams. I raise Labrador Retrievers. I think at last count, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 right now. And uh, about four years ago, I bought a beautiful white Labrador Retriever, male, Samson. Samson, at the time I brought him home, weighed about 10, 11 pounds. Gina has this miniature schnauzer, Marty. Marty weighs in at about 15 pounds. So I bring Sam home and uh, Sam is wanting to play, but Marty is exerting his dominance over Sam. And uh, he walks up and throws his chest out and he postures like this and he's walking around and, you know, Sam's wanting to play and Marty rolls him over on the ground. Well, an amazing thing began to happen. If you know anything about Labrador Retrievers, I mean, they grow fast. And so Sam goes from 10, 11 pounds to 20 pounds to 30 pounds to 50 pounds, to 80 pounds. Marty, still about 14, 15 pounds. Here's the deal. You feed them side by side, Sam comes up and starts to eat, Marty comes up, Sam outweighs him four times, Marty finishes his food, he knocks Sam out of the way. <laughs> if Sam looks at him like, what are you doing? He postures, and that 80-pound Labrador Retriever rolls over on his back <laughs> in a submissive position, and this 14-pound miniature schnauzer standing over him like this saying, you better not get up, you better not get up, you better not get up. Now think about it. Going retro. I mean, just kind of like Samson. Uh, we focus on the wrong things if we're not real careful. And if you remember the bad stuff from the past, the evil stuff, the, the mistakes, if you're not real careful, it freezes us in the present and it hurts the prospects for the future. And so in our minds, we go back and we begin to think thoughts like this. I'll never forget what they said about me when I was a kid. I'll never forget what so-and-so told me about my personality. I really regret what I did in that relationship, and I'm not sure that I can ever move on. I remember all the times that I've messed up, and that's all I can remember, and I don't believe that God can use me because of where I've been and what I've done. You see, it's the fear of the future, being fed from the fears of the past. And these inner emotions and these memories tend to starve our potential. Often they come from hurtful words and circumstances of our childhood. You know, it's amazing. 
But every negative memory from those early days is seared into our minds as if somebody took a branding iron and just branded us with it. And we can't shake it. It pops onto the screen of our mind. It, it flies into our memory. And time after time after time, we recall the mess-ups, the broken relationships, the mistakes, the hurtful things. And these emotions go from long ago and they creep into our conscious over and over and over until we begin to succumb to the graining influence on our life. But listen to me. The past is not all bad. I mean, when you think about your past, it's not all bad. You see, God wants to use the past. God wants to use the positive things that happened in your life, but God will also use the bad things that have happened in your life. He wants to use the positive and the negative, and He wants to use it to build us up, to prepare us for the future. You see, going retro, if you focus on the good times and the bad can be good, and it can make you strong. So what I want to do today is I want to share with you some of the steps that will help you with future fear. Because the, the truth of the matter is, a lot of us who name the name of Christ, we are petrified to move beyond where we are. We are dead in our tracks. We're not making progress. And if we're dead honest with ourselves, the reason that we're not making the progress that we can make for the kingdom of God is because... We are paralyzed by fear. So here's the question. How, how do you overcome it? How do you deal with future fear? How do you look down the road and see what's coming and move on in spite of it? Well, let me share with you several things today. The first thing you've got to do is this. You have to display a determined mindset. Now, you may remember the children of Israel, right? And they often found it difficult to move, uh, to use the past in a positive way. E either they would distort the negative aspects of their bondage, or they would distort the miraculous, or they would forget all the good things that God had done for them. And when you read their story, I mean, you discover that God miraculously delivered them from 500 years of slavery in Egypt. And through 10 plagues that eventually led to their freedom, Time and time again, you read their story, God proved His power over and over and over and over again in their life. And after all that God had done for them, you would think that they would look back over their shoulder, they would look at the history that they had, that you would look at the track record that God had in their life, and they would remember all the supernatural acts of God from the past. And when they found themselves pressed up against the Red Sea, being pursued by the Egyptian army, God delivered them just in the nick of time. And with all they had been through, you would think that they would trust God to deliver them once again from the hand of their enemies. But the Israelites went retro. They went retro in a negative light, and they began to moan and whine and complain. They have kin folks that live today. I mean, instead of looking back and praising God for all that He had done for them, you know what they did? They blamed God. They blamed Moses for putting them in another life threatening predicament, for taking them away from their comfort zone of slavery and into the wilderness of new opportunities. And you know what really is amazing? Israel looked back on their slavery and oppression as the better times as the good old days of their life. But in the midst of the negative emotions, look what Moses says in Exodus 14. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will no longer see them again forever. And the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome to have a Moses to speak that into your life? I mean, there you stand, gripped by fear, uncertain about the future, don't know what's going to happen next, don't understand the circumstances you're going through. Wouldn't it be awesome if you just had a Moses in your life that would just say, hey, just relax, stand still, 
God has everything in control. What an incredible scripture because it's still relevant. You see, God's message of hope, it has not changed. Uh, stand still, stand firm, see the deliverance of the Lord. You see, when you feel that fear is overshadowing you, you know what you do? You stand firm. The Bible says to be still and to know that I'm God. And God's saying to be still and remember what I have done in the past, when I've cared for you, when I've delivered you. You ever felt like an Egyptian army was pursuing you? You ever felt like you were backed into a corner and there's no way to go, there's nowhere out, no way out, and you look around and all of a sudden fear begins to ri just rise up in your inner being and you stand there and you are petrified. You don't know what to do. You ever feel pressed up against the Red Sea? Well, here's the question. Are you whining and are you moaning? I mean, are you saying things, you know what, I'd be better off if things were the way that they used to be. I, I messed up too much for God to deliver me this time. I, I'm afraid of what might happen in the future. You need to be still and listen to the voice of God. Go retro in a positive way and remember the salvation of the Lord. Look back and see the hand of God at work in your life. See the victory. See how God has guided, God has provided. And take those good memories of God's deliverance and faithfulness with you into the future. So if you're going to overcome future fear, you've got to display a determined mindset. You've got to stand firm. But you also need to engage in a deliberate activity. You see, being still and standing firm doesn't mean we do nothing while we wait on God. That's not what it means. As you trust God with the future, you need to be taking the next step along the path. And the truth is, a lot of times we're overwhelmed with the future because we try to see too far ahead. But here's the thing you've got to understand. This race of faith that you're running, this faith walk that you're involved in, do you know what God requires of you? Take the next step. That's all he's asking you to do. Take the next step. And when you take that step, take the next step. Uh, you can't sit back and wait for everything to unfold before you. You ever been there? You're like, all right, Lord, you know, I'm willing to do whatever, go wherever, be whatever. Uh, but, but God, I, I, you, you've got to give me the plan. Lord, show me the plan. Show me everything that you want to do. Show me how you're going to open the doors that no one else is going to open. God doesn't work that way. Because if he worked that way, we wouldn't have to demonstrate our faith. And so God says, just take the step. Then take the next step. You see, all God requires is that we take the next step because we know that ultimately He holds the future in His hands. But when He reveals only what we need to know, where we need to go, one step at a time. Exodus chapter 14, 15. God replied to Moses and responded to these whining Israelites. And the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. You see, before God ever told Moses to raise his staff and to divide the sea, he told the Israelites, go forward. And God told them to move it while Moses had told them to be still and to stand firm. And somebody would look at that and say, oh, wait a minute now, we've got a problem with Scripture. There's a contradiction in commands there. No, there's no contradiction in command. Moses is addressing the inner turmoil when he told them to be still. I mean, you've got to remember now, these folks are terrified. They'd left all of their security blankets behind. They had come as far as they could go. They're backed up to the Red Sea. They're in a pocket. There's no way out. They're surrounded on three sides. They look back, and in the, in the, in the, in the distance, 
they see a dust cloud, the armies of Pharaoh are closing in on them, and they think that it is over, that it is done, that they're going to be slaughtered, that they're going to be massacred, or that they're going to be taken back into captivity. In other words, they thought they'd been brought to the desert to die. And so fear had trapped their inner resolve. And Moses is telling them, be at peace because God is not going to let you down. There's also a word from Moses in reaction to their desire to go backward instead of moving forward. They were confused. They didn't know whether to fight or flee. And their emotions are telling them to flee. Their emotion is saying, get out of there. To run back into the army of the oppressors, to beg for mercy. But God, on the other hand, had a different plan. And so he's going to fight for them. He's going to take them forward to the land that he promised them, a land of freedom, a land of opportunity. And Moses is saying to squelch their natural instincts and to stand firm against the basic reaction to run away from the obstacles before them. Have you ever run when you should have stood? Have you ever become afraid and because of fear you made a bad decision? You went with your emotions rather than what you should have done. You ran away and you robbed God of the opportunity to do something great in your life. You robbed God of the opportunity to manifest himself and to deliver you and to show you a way out. You robbed God of, of an opportunity to prove to you, hey, I'm God and I've got everything under control. So God says, move on. What God's saying is stop whining and get going. You know, that's a, that's a lesson for all of us. You know, there comes times where you just got to move on. Well, you got to stop the whining, you got to stop the complaining, uh, you got to stop the belly aching, and, and you look at where you are, and you've got two choices. Continue to look in the rearview mirror as you go down the road, and if you get out here on 75 today and you start driving, and your attention is on the rearview mirror, what's going to happen? You're going to have a wreck. And so we have, the, we have the option, are we going to focus on the rearview mirror and keep looking behind us, or are we going to look out the windshield and look down the road? God said to them, move on. Moses hadn't even lifted his hand yet to make the path, but God wanted the Israelites to respond in faith. He wanted them to take the next step into the water. He wanted them to trust that God would make a way for them. And that's what God wants to do with you. You see, when you're dealing with doubts and, and, and skeletons from the past, you know what God says? Move on. When you're paralyzed by fear and the uncertainty of the future, move on. When you've lifted your, uh, when, you're, when your limited vision only allows you to see what's just ahead of you, move on. And even what lies just ahead of you, if it seems insurmountable, you know what God says? Move on. Walk as far as you can and trust God for the next step. And after that, trust Him for the next step. And after that, trust Him for the next step. And after that, trust Him for the next step. And after that, trust Him for the next step. All God asks as we look toward the future, just take the next step. Because I'm, I'm way down the road in front of you. I've cleared the path before you. There are doors that I'm going to open that you don't know are going to open until you take the step. Think of it this way. It's easier for God to guide you when you're moving than when you are dead weight standing still. 
I learned to drive at the age of 12. My granddaddy had an old international scout, kind of like a Jeep. And we had a hunting camp in South Florida and we used to go down there and my granddaddy would let me drive him all over those woods. That international scout, first of all, was a standard transmission. It wasn't automatic, so I had to learn to shift and work the clutch and the gas and all, and it was exciting to begin with, trust me. <laughs> but the other thing is, it had no power steering. Now, those of you that are my age or older, you understand driving without power steering. Uh, you had to crank the steering wheel to turn it. And if it was standing still, I mean, it was really difficult to turn the wheel if the vehicle wasn't moving. But here's the deal. Once you began to roll, you could steer with one hand. No problem. But when it came to a standing stop, trying to turn the wheel was real work. You see, God wants you to be in motion. If you're taking that step, if you're in motion, if you're walking by faith, if you are trusting God for the next step, if you're trusting God for the answer, if you're trusting God for the circumstances in your life, it is easier for God to guide you when you're moving than it is for Him to guide you when you're just sitting still. So in order to overcome future fear, you display, display a determined mindset, engage in the deliberate action. But third, you're aware of a definite caution. You see, trusting God with the future is easier said than done because fear has a way of appearing more powerful than God is. Isn't it amazing? Uh, you turn on the news today and, and you look toward the future, it's not pretty. But here's the deal. Gary Frazier will be here next week. He's going to talk about end times. Uh, look, we know how it's going to end. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. We've read the book. We know who wins in the end, right? Amen. But as you look to the future, if you're not real careful, you look at the economy and say, oh, it's not good. You look at the political scene, not good. Uh, you look at the world stage, not good. And if you're not real careful, what happens is the circumstances, the events, and the episodes that are happening on the planet today can appear bigger than God if you're not real careful. So when you're overwhelmed by a certain situation or with indecision about which way you go, if you're not real careful, you can lose sight of the awesomeness of God. In other words, we make more out of fear than it really is. Fear, rather than the power and the promise and the provision of God, becomes our motivation if we're not careful. Well, if I don't do this, then this is going to happen. If I don't do this, then that is going to happen. That's fear talking. So God gives us direction in His Word as to how to put fear in His proper place. Nobody does a better job of it than a guy in the Old Testament, a man of prayer named Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah is a Jewish man born in Persian captivity, and he's elevated to the second most important position of the king. He is a wine taster to the king, King Artaxerxes. In other words, uh, Nehemiah as a wine taster, had a lot of power. He would taste the king's wine. He would taste the king's food that he ate and he drank. Uh, if, if the king saw the, the wine tester keel over and die, he knew something. Don't eat it. Don't drink it. That's what you call a clue, okay? But the wine taster also had the, had the king's attention. He was a confidant. He was a trusted advisor with whom the king would share intimate and state secrets. And so one day Nehemiah is praying, and God told him to ask King Artaxerxes for a favor. God wanted him to leave his job, to travel 800 miles, and to rebuild the city walls around Jerusalem, Nehemiah's home. 
Now that's a scary proposition because Nehemiah had to have the king's permission to leave. He had to have the king's permission to carry out a task. And if the king didn't like his request, the king could have him executed. So Nehemiah appreciated his role. He approached the king with this respect in Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came about in the month of Nisan. In the twelfth year of Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Did you hear his honesty in verse number 2? He said, I became dreadfully afraid. Vulnerability, authenticity, the ability to admit your fears. You see, God often uses our fear in our lives to drive us to Him. In fact, fear will do one of two things. It will drive you to God or it will drive you away from God. And really the choice is up to you. So Nehemiah had prayed to God. And in the midst of his fear, he trusted God with the outcome. And so without that sense of fear, he might have tried to confront the king on his own power and his own strength. But God used his fear to bring Nehemiah to a place of dependence on him. And so Nehemiah knew that he had to have a difficult conversation with the king and that the outcome of the conversation would be left completely up unto the grace of God. Now, you know what Nehemiah did? He followed the admit commit rule. He admitted his fear and he committed it to God in prayer. And so he talks to God about it in chapter 1 verse 11. Listen to his prayer here. Oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. He prayed. Guess what? Still afraid. Still fearful. And even after the prayer, he was still a man of natural emotions, but he committed his anxiety to God. And, and, and he just said, you know what, God? Here it is. This is what it is. This is what I'm dealing with. I'm going to trust you with it. And so he faces the fear. He walks into the king's palatial palace. He makes the request. And look again at chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, at what God did. God understood Nehemiah's fears, and he used these fearful emotions in a positive way. God allowed the king to do what? He saw distress on Nehemiah's face. And the king asked him, What's wrong with you? Why are you distraught? Why are you sad? Why are you troubled? Now get this. The king of Persia was concerned about the emotional state of his wine taster. And so they'd open the door for Nehemiah to explain why he looked sad and the king would help him. And you know what? When you read the rest of the story, through Artaxerxes, God granted Nehemiah the privilege of going back, remodeling the city walls around Jerusalem. And get this. Not only did God allow him to do it, the king of Persia picked up the tab for the trip. Do you see what happened? Nehemiah committed his fears to God and he allowed them to be used for his glory. And Artaxerxes financed the entire building project. Man, that's an incredible story. Nehemiah didn't deify fear. Nehemiah didn't put his fear on a pedestal. He didn't bow down to his fear. He didn't cower in front of it. He didn't let it rule his life. He admitted it, committed it, and he faced it. You know what you need to do? You need to get honest with God and you need to talk to God about your fears. I mean, just admit it. Just commit it. 
God, I am fearful and I need your help. God, help me to take the step in the right direction. Who's the King Artaxerxes in your life? What fear in your life do you need to face? You see, God's looking for honesty. He's looking for a willingness to take the first step of faith, and He'll take care of the rest. So dealing with future fear, you display a determined mindset, engage in deliberate activity, are aware of a definite caution, and then you enjoy a delightful adventure. So whenever you begin to face your fears... You begin to make choices in life. You need to realize, if you haven't figured it out yet, life is exciting. Never a dull moment in life. I mean, just about the time your life is going to get boring, something happens. An episode, a circumstance, a challenge, a storm. And sometimes... When you look at your life, it seems like it's beyond your control, and it often will be. But here's the thing you need to remember. God is in control, and as the Apostle Paul tells us, His strength will be made perfect in our weakness, and you can rest assured that life will always promise to be an exciting ride. You know, there's nothing boring about being a Christian unless you're paralyzed by fear and you take the easy road. Some of you never share your faith because you're paralyzed by fear. Some of you refuse to use your God-given gifts and, and abilities because you're, parified, you're paralyzed for fear. You're afraid you'll fail. You're afraid that you won't be effective. Some of you are paralyzed by fear in the area that God is, is trying to lead you. He's trying to direct you. He's trying to guide you. And you're really resistant to go. And you ask the what if question. Well, what if I go and this happens? What if I don't go? What if? What if? What if? But here's the thing you got to understand. When you look at Christianity, God has not called us to walk the easy road. He's called us to walk a narrow road. A road that is filled with ups and downs, with hills and valleys, tight curves and bends. It's a great adventure in following Christ. And the roller coaster of, of, of a life of authentic faith, it, it, it's exciting. There's no place for worry. There's no place for timidity in that kind of life that God wants you to have. And so Jesus summarized the appropriate response to worry and anxiety in Matthew 6, 34. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's a strong statement from Jesus. And the verse is basically that worry and anxiety... If you boil it all down, really, there's sins before God. The word worry literally means to be pulled in different directions. You ever felt like you were pulled in different directions? Or are you focused on opportunities? Are you focused on challenges that, that God has given you today? What is it that God has for you today? What about tomorrow? What is it today? And when you pillow your head tonight, I mean, can you honestly say before the Father, Father, I took advantage of the opportunities and the challenges that were before me today. I honored you with my life today. I brought, as best I know how, I brought glory to your name today through my actions, my attitudes, my speech, my behavior. Father, today, Amen. I did everything I could today. And go to sleep. And if your eyes open in the morning and you take another breath for another day, you take that step that day. You know, 
We're pretty incredible spin doctors regarding worry. Uh, we don't call it worry anymore. We say things like this, I'm maxed out. I'm just maxed out. You know what it means? That means I got more on my plate than I can handle. I'm stressed to the max. And a lot of us are so worried about tomorrow that it messes us up for today. And it causes a chain reaction of worry and stress resulting in a messed up tomorrow. And this cycle goes on and on until we don't know anything else in our lives but a constant feeling of worry and anxiety. And Jesus, what he's saying in Matthew 6, 34, is to break free from the cycle and to find a center of peace, a center of contentment and plans and the purpose of God. So, God knows your tomorrows. Somebody asked me one time, said, why doesn't God allow us to know tomorrow? Or tomorrow? Or the next day? Why doesn't God allow us to see it? You know the only answer I have for that? If God allowed us to see it all, we not not be able to handle it all. We've got our hands full with today. Just today. And when you yield to God's control and you trust the future to Him and you find the antidote for future fears, instead of being pulled in, in a million different directions, you're allowing yourself to be pulled in only one direction, and that's God's. God has an agenda for your life. God has a plan that He's working out. And he has a purpose. There is nothing that happens in your life that's a mistake. In other words, God isn't surprised by anything that happens in your life. God is already to this afternoon with you. You and I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon, but God's in, he's already at this afternoon and he's waiting on you. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He's already there. He is Alpha and Omega. Alpha, the first Greek letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last. In other words, we would say that God is everything from A to Z. You think about it. We have 26 letters that make up our form of communication in English. Everything that ever has been said, everything that ever will be said has been said using those 26 letters. God is everything from A to Z. God has it covered. So how do we deal with future fear? You say, well, I don't know what's going to happen with my husband. I don't know what's going to happen with my wife. I don't know what's going to happen with my children. I don't know what's going to happen with my grandchildren. I don't know what's going to happen with my job. I don't know what's going to happen with the, the economy. I, I don't know what's going to happen with our retirement. We may not even have a retirement. We, we may have to work until, until we die. That's a novel idea. Retirement's not in the Bible. Sorry, it's just not there. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know what? I don't know either but I do know who does know. Amen. And I know that we can trust him with it. Listen. Listen to the words of Jesus one more time. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Father, if we're honest, we've all been paralyzed by fear of what might happen and what might come. But Lord, I thank you 
that you're already there before us. That you are with us, you are for us, you are in us, you are empowering us. And I pray, God, that we would trust you with this day. We would trust you with each step of the journey. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. How's your faith journey? How is your faith walk? How are you moving? God's not saying take 10 steps right now. He's saying take one. And then trust Him for the next. Take another and another and another. In just a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to sing. This altar's open. You can come and you can get honest with God. Here's the thing. God knows you're afraid. He knows the circumstances behind it. He knows the reason for it. Will you admit it and commit it to Him? Others of you may be searching for a church home. We'd love to have you come and join us here. Uh, Rob and Bobby are here. Just come to one of them and say, we want to we be a part of this body of believers. And if you never trusted Jesus and you'd like to trust Him, you can come this morning and say, hey, I want to become a, a Christ follower. And we'll talk with you and pray with you about what that means. Lord, you've not given us into a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Give us the faith to walk into the future with confidence, knowing that you are there, you are guiding every step of the way. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and we're going to sing. I